Hi everyone, my name is Sjoukje van Len and I'm the Conservative of Contemporary Art here at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I am Rachel Stark. I am currently interning in the Conservation Lab as a requirement of the Queen's University Master of Art Conservation program. This is the final component of the program and I'm very excited to be working here at the AGO with Shokia and in part with the Contemporary Arts Collection. Um, yeah, today Rachel and I uh, are going to introduce you to the conservation of plastics and uh, some dilemmas that we are facing uh, with a very interesting contemporary artwork that we are currently uh, working on. Um, but before we continue, um, we would like to acknowledge that the land that the AGO is on is, is on Mishisagik Nishap territory, Mississauga. Um, it is also governed by the by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Mishisagik Nishap territory that has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. So, oh, as an art concert to specialize in contemporary arts. Um, I often get pretty surprised reactions when people hear that uh, contemporary art already uh, needs any uh, attention um, because it's not really expected that artworks that are fairly new already need some sort of like conservation um, yeah, attention or even treatment. Uh, at the AGO, we have a massive uh, contemporary art collection and it's also uh, fast growing. Um, and in the meantime, it's also the collection that definitely needs, uh, or it shows most of its very unique challenges, uh, and also, uh, needs uh, a lot of ten attention regarding preservation and conservation. Um, this is because the materials are often very varied. Um, so it can include like very traditional materials as stone and bone or wood, uh, metals. Um, but I often also work with materials that are very non-traditional um, and you can think about like foods or motors and lights, um, sounds, or uh, in this case, uh, we work on uh, plastics. Um, all these materials are extremely versatile and uh, my job at the AGO is to make sure that uh, all these contemporary artworks uh, that we have in the collection are still uh, on still being understood by our colleagues and enjoyed by the pu public in uh, 50 years um, or hopefully even more. Um, Rachel, you have, a fairy, you have a more varied background in art conservation, being um, working both on objects and paintings. Um, how would you describe our job? Yeah, that's right. Um, in school, I really focused on paintings and painted surfaces, but I also have a background working with objects. And so the Contemporary Arts Collection is such a cool, wide range of both paintings and objects. So it's really exciting to see a lot of different materials and different kinds of works of art. I would describe our job as a combination of preservation, restoration, um, art concept Art conservators dedicate themselves to the care and preservation of works of art and to protecting them from future damage and deterioration. And we try to preserve as much of the original material as possible um, in a condition as close to the original as possible. And any additions or repairs should usually be reversible or removable. But we also want to do all we can ethically to bring deteriorated work um, artwork back to how it was originally intended to look as well. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I think we have one of the best there in the world. Yeah, we do. It's really, really, really <laughs> amazing to work um, so closely uh, and work with our hands on these beautiful mm -hmm. uh, objects. Um, as I said before, um, Artworks or contemporary artworks often contain very, uh, like a various amount of non-traditional materials. And one beautiful example is the project that Rachel and I are currently working on, uh, which is made of uh, plastics and other synthetic materials. And there are also uh, photographs integrated. Um, Rachel, can you tell more about uh, this artwork? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so one of the works um, that I will be working on with Shokia here at the AGO is this amazing 
artwork called The Space of the Llama by Canadian artist Joyce Wieland. Um, so this artwork is a great example of kind of a non-traditional art form. You know, it's not a painting, it's more sculptural. Um, this was made in the 1960s and it's constructed mostly from plastic, which was this amazing new material at the time that artists were experimenting with in lots of exciting ways. It's really brightly colored, it's shiny, and it's just really different from traditional artist materials, which is why a lot of artists were excited to use it. And Joyce Wieland was a Canadian artist who started work practicing in the 1950s, painting originally and making experimental films. She moved to New York City in the 1960s with her husband, who was well-known Canadian artist, Michael Snow. And she began experimenting with different media and materials and kind of construction techniques at that time. And that's where she made this piece. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's so interesting that she was uh, making this while living in New York. Um, because uh, New York was a, in the 1960s such a vibrant place, um, something that we cannot imagine right now. But at that time, rent was uh, extremely cheap and it made a lot of artists uh, move to that city, um, making it into a really cool hub where artists had the financial space to create and to uh, manifest. Um, it was also the beginning of the pop art movement, uh, and artists were experimenting with a wide range of non-traditional materials and, uh, aesthetic forms. Um, and one big movement that was kind of like happening with it, with, like as well, was that a lot of artists started to work in this, uh, or to make like these really puffy, uh, three-dimensional objects. Uh, and on this slide, I put, uh, or we show, um, two famous examples of, uh, like puffy artworks uh, by artists that were both working and living in New York uh, in the 1960s. Um, the famous Florberger is um, now in the HO's collection and uh, it is a blown, uh, it's a giant blown up hamburger uh, that Oldenburg created from painted fabric uh, and he stuffed it with all sorts of materials. And the other example is uh, Yayo, Yayoi Kusama's uh, Valley Brew. Um, that was a loan to the HEO in 2017 for the major solo exhibition uh, of Kusama. Uh, and here she created, uh, and this work is also originally from the 1960s. And uh, in this uh, work, she created with like fabric and stuffing, hundreds and hundreds of stuffed Emma uh, forms that all together create this big field. Um, and knowing that these are Two of the you know, two artists that were also working in uh, New York at the same time that Joyce Wieland was living and working there. It's interesting to see that this, yeah, puffy, um, these these puffy artworks that the, that they kind of like all are doing it in a way. Um, and I think the space of the llama is uh, a really beautiful example um, to place sort of like in this time frame uh, and. Besides uh, the space of the llama, uh, Joyce Wieland was also making many other like puffy artworks and uh, even quilts. And um, you can see it later in her oeuvre as well. Yeah, it is really interesting. Like, was she following the trends of the time where she's starting them? The idea of like these kind of sewn construction pieces, um, you know, certainly were kind of more like towards like women's work where sewing and quilting and that's certainly those are certainly things that Joyce Wieland was was in like exploring in her work at that time um she was also combining her love of filmmaking with these pieces um where uh um you know some of her paintings as well as her um puffy plastic pieces like this one reference film um in the structure like the floor where she's attached segments in a vertical line suggesting the connected stills on a film strip with each little piece telling a part of you know the story as well as in this case the more additional uh the more uh, literal edition of a film reel um so those are all like direct comparisons to film there's also a very personal work where this little boy's face is a close personal uh the child of a close personal friend of hers so um she's including really very personal images 
And um, it also plays off a lot of the world events that were happening at the time, like space exploration, with this picture on uh, the right being the first image of Earth seen from orbit around the moon taken by the Lunar Orbiter 1 uh, in 1966, which was the year this piece was made, so very current events. And then again, um, film being like literally directly included in the piece as well. So here we have some film stock encased in, um, in the composition. Yeah, so cool. I find uh, there's so much uh, symbolism hidden in this work. Um, that is another part of this research that's uh, together with the curatorial or the curator we are trying to yeah figure out what the meaning is of all these images and why they are placed together. Um, that's, um, that's not the focus that we are going to talk about uh, today. Um, so this artwork was donated to the HO in 2017 by uh, Joyce's longtime friend, Betty Ferguson. Uh, and this artwork is a really great uh, and amazing addition to all the other uh, Joyce Whelan's we already have in our collection um, because the space of the llamas uh, is an um, unique example of her early work in the 1960s. Um, because of the materials um, and, it, and this artwork was hung in a private home for pretty much its uh, entire life. Uh, the work shows some challenge, challenging condition issues uh, when it was brought in our collection in 2017. Um, the damage and deterioration that we observe today uh, is not really a surprise um, realizing that it hung so many decades in a house uh, that had an unclimatized environment. Um, also, because this artwork is meant to hung on uh, on the wall with its uh, integrated strips, um, it also creates just by the way it's hanging, it's creating it creates a lot of stress in, on its own material. And in some areas, this already resulted uh, in some small rips and deformations of the plastics. Um, also because of the natural aging of plastics, the material is already becoming brittle and will probably become more brittle over time. Um, and in that way, it also breaks and rips easier. Um, the plastic, especially the transparent plastics, um, are more yellowed uh, than they once were. And this is also partially because it collects a lot of uh, surface like dust and debris. Um, but it's also because of its natural aging um, effects uh, that either were caused by uh, ultraviolet uh, light, like sunlight can be a source of that, or um, just the oxygen in the air. Um, it's also what I find always very interesting when you deal with artworks that are um, especially from an earlier period when plastics were just fairly new on the market. Um, and, and becoming more and more available for like the every, uh, yeah, everyday life. Um, plastics in the 1960s, um, so also when Joyce Wieland created this piece, were really on the market and seen as this new sub super products. Um, it also was kind of like expected that these, this material would, you know, last forever. You could do pretty much everything with it and uh, didn't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and now, uh, in this case, with the Joyce Wieland work, we are uh, more than 50 years later, we can see that the aging of plastics uh, can happen extremely quick. Um, and already, yeah, it really shows some aging uh, to a degree that uh, we have to step in or, um, yeah, do something. Yeah, and yeah, unfortunately, this piece is like, obviously needs some help. Um, so right now, Shokia and I are figuring out the best ways to treat space llama and to preserve it and allow it to be displayed to the public. So one of the first steps in treating an object like this is to do a lot of research and a lot of testing to figure out, figure out exactly what the materials are. Um, one initial investigation tool we use is multispectral imaging, which uses different wavelengths. Uh, of light to see different components of the materials and construction. For example, here uh, we have ultraviolet and infrared photography. So ultraviolet and infrared light used to help characterize and differentiate between the materials. 
It can detect things like changes in the composition. It can pick up faded or obscured markings. So you can see there's a really big difference between these two images that can give us information about what the materials are that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also it can see if there's any, you know, previous restorations or damages or anything like that. Um, it's a really great tool to use. Um, and also, um, the, uh, identification of plastics when we work with plastic materials is, uh, an available, um, scientific analysis method. So the way it, that we can determine what kind of plastics we are working with is also extremely important, uh, for our own health and safety. Um, it's because, uh, many additives and chemicals were, and still are used in the development of plastics. And, uh, some of these are, uh, or they can be extremely harmful for any life organisms on, uh, this planet. So that includes us human beings, uh, as well, um, uh, especially specializers, uh, that were used in, um, plastics, which were used to make uh, some plastics more flexible or, um, yeah, just, uh, just more, uh, uh to give it more shape. These plasticizers can uh, especially be extremely harmful. So when we start to um, work on an object like this, it is uh, important to know what kind of plastics we work with so we can uh, protect ourselves and also adjust uh, the right treatments. Um, um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, treatment to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the um, scientific and methods of scientific analysis that we use um, to help us figure out exactly what the materials uh, are is FTIR. So in this case, we ran FTIR analysis on a bunch of different samples of the plastics. And so this uses machines and computers to expose the samples to infrared radiation and then measures the different wavelengths absorbed and reflected by the material. And that gives a spectra that is unique to each different kind of plastic. Um, and then different kinds of plastics need different methods of cleaning and different storage conditions and different handling. Um, so it's important, as Shok said, to know the composition of what we're dealing with. And this is one of the ways that we can figure that out. So um, the goal of uh, our research and treatment uh, projects for this artwork mm -hmm. is to understand uh, the deeper meaning of this work. So the conceptual meaning. Um, and it's especially like looking into these photographs and working together with a curator and, um, to, to, um, yeah, find some more of the, the concept of it. And on the other hand, we, uh, uh, had to get the artwork ready and presentable for a future exhibition. Um, besides that, this artwork is covered, uh, in an, uh, or the surface is covered with, uh, quite some dust and debris. There are also some, um, uh, rips and gaps in the plastic material and it has per like some permanent deformations. Um, and in some areas, the material is really ailing sort of threads, uh, and the seams that hold the artwork sort of together is in some areas already failing. Um, right now, uh, it makes it that this artwork cannot be installed. Uh, as it is intended by the artist, and our goal is um, that with the treatment we can make it presentable in the way it should be seen by the public. Yeah, and so um, some of the ways we'll be treating this piece will just be to clean off the dust and all the soiling on the surface, just through carefully brushing it and vacuuming. Uh, the material testing we did will help us figure out kind of like what kind of wet cleaning we should do. Um, what, uh, how we could, you know, um, really uh, make sure that the plastic is safe, but clean it up as, as best as we can. And then next steps might be to make a mount to be able to show the piece vertically as it, as Shoki said, as it was meant to be seen, but adding support so that all the stress is not just on those thin little support hanging structures. Um, yeah. And another thing that is nice to mention is that uh, we have uh, numerous colleagues all over the world who already did uh, groundbreaking research uh, to the conservation of plastics. So we have an amazing um, pool of knowledge to already work from um, and um, yeah, that can help us with getting an, the best sort of like treatment plan together for this artwork. 
Um, and besides that, it would be also great that with the outcomes of this choice wheeling project, uh, we can also contribute to the um, international community by better on that, bringing some more knowledge. Um, yeah, so we kind of, like, we just started this project this summer. Um, so we're just kind of like at the beginning of it. So I'm pretty sure that more is fun. Well, yeah. yeah, it'll be really exciting to see how it kind of like branches out and we find more and more information about this piece and similar pieces by Joyce Wheeland and then similar plastic pieces as well. There's a lot of plastic out there. Yeah, no, I'll take the sticks. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks for talking with me, Shu. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>